where the authors and editors discuss news and events with a splash of history. Our host today is Dan Masterson. Joining him is Jim Dunnigan, well-known military author and the Dean. Welcome in Austin and Jim. Uh, a lot continues to happen over in the Middle East. Um, Jim, how long is it going to be? be uh, um, let me just say that we're recording this on February 2nd. And, uh, you know, attacks continue to happen and we've lost several service members um, from, you know, Iranian proxies. How long before the U.S. attacks uh, Iran? Well, Iran is very concerned about that. Apparently the attack um, that killed our troops was unauthorized. And the Iranians have, uh, un, you know, uncharacteristically uh, run in there and basically uh, chastise these fellows. Uh, they do not want a war with us. Uh, they've managed to avoid that so far, and they really will go out of their way if they have to, uh, to avoid any incident that would basically compel the United States to attack Iran. They cannot afford in a war with the United States. Uh, and uh, it, it, it could get very ugly very quickly. I mean, Iran is a major manufacturer of missiles. They have a nuclear weapons program they're still work, they're working on, which is apparently moving forward slowly. And um, the Iranians are rather prudent as, <laughs> as nations go in that part of the world, like Saudi Arabia. You know, they want to be a factor, but they don't want to be a combatant. Uh, so, you know, there's hope in that department. But, you know, it is getting rather shaky because the Iranian proxies are uh, <laughs> out of control more than usual. So, Austin, what do you see happening? Well, I think February 2nd, Groundhog's Day, is a, actually a good day to record this because we've had so many problems, terror problems, attacks, uh, proxy wars started by, uh, uh, Iran since, uh, well, Khomeini took, uh, uh, power in 79 and, well, uh, he had to deal with an attack coming from Saddam Hussein in, in, in Iraq. But after that, Iran started its, uh, war throughout the Middle East. It started, uh, seeding, uh, trouble, trouble bait. Uh, meddling, meddling operations, is another way to put it, uh, uh, in the, the late 1980s. Uh, and we've had uh, attacks on U.S. forces that are traceable uh, to Iran uh, repeatedly, uh, including in the 1990s, uh, and uh, one, at least one in Saudi Arabia staged uh, by, by Iran, and uh, it repeats. And now we're to a situation where... Uh, Iran is waging a multi-front war uh, on Israel and is uh, waging a subversive proxy war against the United States and uh, has even attempted uh, to uh, assassinate uh, the targets, hit targets, blow up targets, and kill people inside the United States. That's, uh, well, that's been proven using uh, their, uh, their agents here. They were going to uh, actually detonate a bomb in Washington, D.C., so, the one thing we, that is not repeated you know, on this Groundhog Day is the United States has not taken it to the uh, source of all these wars, and that's Iran. How soon do we do it? Well, it's not lack of military options. Uh, we've got the power, uh, I think, and we've actually talked about this, Dan, six, seven years ago on uh, a podcast, uh, Jim and I, Jim and I did with you, uh, uh, about a simultaneous strategic bombing strike to take out Iranian uh, nuclear assets. May have been more than eight years ago, now that I think about it. Uh, that, that, I'll talk about that later in the program if you want, if you want to. We can go back over it because we have the assets to hit uh, literally dozens of sites and some of the targets deep in a food don't actually destroy the target you destroyed their ability to uh, use it uh, as a functional, either uh, research site, weapon storage site, launch site, 
and uh, we haven't used that. And I said, it, strategic bombing, it sounds like we're, we're going all out with uh, with heavy bombers. The heavy bombers would be carrying just some of the weapons. We have other ways to get to it. Uh, we haven't uh, really put the screws to Iran. Trump administration uh, did more so than uh, other other administrations, but there were always holes in the uh, economic sanctions, and Iran goes around breaking up to, to all the time. Uh, illegal uh, oil sales, uh, both the, my pipeline and, and natural gas, and uh, you know, essentially uh, sanction violations uh, in the open with about a half dozen nations that uh, are, are regular uh, purchasers of uh, Iranian oil. Uh, we've struck back with that, but then we relax it, and uh, we we don't try to close the holes, and we don't stay at it. And that's uh, a lack of political will and uh, really benighted political leadership that uh, has uh, produced that uh, situation. I mean, utterly benighted was the, the Obama administration thinking they were going to get a nuclear deal with Iran, that the uh, IRGC would uh, live up to uh, a treaty? No, that's not going to happen. You see how absolutely wicked uh, the regime is here in what it's uh, what it's doing right now with its war uh, war against Israel. But that's not just against Israel. They've got waging a war in Syria. They're waging a war in Iraq. They're fighting with uh, uh, with Pakistan. Uh, they seem to have backed off at least for a while on on terror attacks in uh, uh, in Europe, but uh, they have a finger in uh, South America and Central America, bedling and murdering at the at the uh, uh, at the same time. Where's the strike back? Well, you've reached a point here with killing Americans, shooting at uh, you know, having the Houthis wage war against global commerce. Something needs to be done to the head of the snake, and that is the, the that's Iran. Uh, I I can't say when it's going to happen because I don't see the political will to do it. Uh, what is Iran's response going to be? Well, they'll be belligerent. They'll shout and scream, and it'll be uh, kind of like what they did when uh, Soleimani was uh, 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 assassinated. Uh, they're not. There's not much they really can do if the United States and its allies unleash the, the kind of military power we've got. Seal off their port. It's a possibility. That's another uh, another uh, another option. You can seal them off with mines or you can bomb them. Now, uh, oh, Austin, you're starting a war. No, Iran's been at war with the United States. Now, I, I trace back with, when their middling, middling operation began, but it's been at war with the, the U.S. since 1979, and we just don't admit it. We've been so powerful, we can kind of sort of ignore it. And now it's come to a head. So you tell me, Dan, when the attacks come. Yeah, but we have the assets. If you want, um, Jim and I can explain simultaneous strategic bombing strike as an example of what we could do. Well, Jim, why don't we do that? Um, talk about how we would hit them. Well, to make it to make a direct attack, we basically uh, uh, unite Iran behind their uh, religious dictatorship. Currently, uh, Iran has a lot of internal problems which are growing. Uh, the economy's a mess. I mean, all these sanctions have had an impact, and uh, the uh, government has put a priority on making mischief overseas, which is, as Austin points out, is a is a is a point of conflict with uh, many Iranians, and um, unless, uh, you know, we do something, uh, uh, an act of war, as it were, against Iran, all that resentment within Iran is going to be directed at their own government. Now, their own government suppresses outright opposition, you know, violently. They kill people. Uh, for example, the hijab, you know, incident, uh, what, two years ago. Uh, when a uh, Kurdish girl was uh, was caught by the religious police and beaten to death uh, for not wearing a head covering, uh, that caused a lot of unrest in um, Iran, which is still going on. 
I mean, the people are basically fed up with the, you know, uh, being reduced to poverty in order to support the, um, you know, the activities of uh, the radicals uh, in Iran who want to basically keep making war on everybody else. Now, you saw another uh, blowback on that. There was that uh, Islamic terrorist attack in Iran, which killed, what, dozens of people and injured many more. Uh, yeah, that's something that had never happened before. Uh, the Iranians are losing control inside Iran. In other words, they don't have the had the uh, support of enough Iranians to basically de detect, you know, internal threats, you know, uh, coming from the outside. And, uh, you know, it, it just gets worse and worse. The Basically, the Iranian people don't like their rulers, and that, that, that dislike grows and grows uh, the more, you know, uh, things go on as the way they are, have been. Well, uh, Dan, I, I, I disagree a, a little bit with Jim on this. He says they're going to, the people are going to unite behind the regime. I think it's gone so far that they're not, especially if you hit the targets that we need to hit, and that's their nuclear production, uh, nuclear uh, research, and storage facilities. And on top of that, you hit all the uh, Republican Guard uh, uh, leadership sites. They're, they're Three or four that that crop up in uh, open source uh, material about where the uh, headquarters of the uh, out well op training and headquarters control uh, 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 elements of Al Quds, the uh, their uh, special forces are located inside Iran, and it, it, where you also do at, as best as we can do locate where their forward deployed Al Quds headquarters are and hit them all in a very short period of time and I th 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 there's a post a very good possibility that you'll have uh, Iranians clapping maybe back at, in the house not where they can be seen so the government uh, secret police come and arrest them but they're gonna be pr happy with it because that's going to hurt the regime it'll hurt it it hurt it badly yeah there have been public uh how should I put it uh, appreciation, signs of, signs of appreciation by the public uh, for previous attacks that basically hit the, uh, you know, the government's uh, activities overseas. The, the Iranian people see that as a main reason for their poverty. All these sanctions and what have you, they'd rather trade with the rest of the world. In fact, until the 1980s when the religious dictatorship, the current religious dictatorship took over, uh, Iran was quite prosperous, and they were trading with their neighbors in the Persian Gulf and the West. Uh, you know, they, they still have a lot of those um, those Western weapons, aircraft, <laughs> that they, some of them are still flying, that they purchased, you know, before the Shah was overthrown. When the Shah was overthrown, the, uh, the religious leaders who basically, you know, were benefited most from it, decided that uh, we're going to be against anything... The uh, Iran was previously at war uh, when the, when the uh, monarchy was in power. And a lot of people now wish the monarchy were back because, you know, things were a lot safer, a lot more prosperous, and uh, they're beginning to wonder, you know, well, you know, what were our parents, you know, we're talking about parents and grandparents now, what were our parents thinking? And the parents basically, most of them agree with the kids, you know, we made a mistake. Uh, we shouldn't have trusted these maniacs. Uh, we didn't know how maniac they were, and they were more maniac than anybody could have, you know, predicted. Uh, but that's religious, you know, fanaticism for you. Their head knows no bounds. They're on a mission from God, and any opposition is uh, irrelevant and, uh, you know, requires uh, retribution. So uh, the Iranians have made their own mess, um, and as Austin points out, they might need a little help, external help, in order to uh, to take it apart and uh, return things to a more peaceful, you know, situation. But it's not going to happen automatically. I mean, Iran is a big country. They still have uh, fairly powerful armed forces, especially the IRGC, which basically is a regime maintenance, you know, organization. <laughs> They're there to keep the, uh, the religious leaders in power. And... Um, uh, they have proven to be quite capable because they're ruthless. Uh, they'll do anything. 
Um, so it's no easy, it's no easy problem to solve. Um, although there's a, there's a remote chance that eventually the Iranian people will have another revolution, which again, they're not, they're not keen on doing because the last few uprisings have killed, killed a lot of Iranian civilians. But, you know, uh, ultimately it will come to a point where the people realize if we don't fight our own, uh, dictatorial government, uh, they're just going to keep making life miserable for us and more miserable. You know, you think it can't get any worse? Well, it does. It can and it will continue to unless, you know, someone internally or externally, you know, puts an end to it. Look, one of the things that uh, the Khomeini's appeal in the 79 was how corrupt the Pahlavis were. Uh, the Pahlavis were uh, crooked. They were thieves. Uh, they uh, lived as uh, multi, multi, multi billionaires, which they were, and the rest of Iran, uh, other Iranians uh, outside of the royal family and those who were on in the corruption uh, circle were suffering, and that was true. That was true. That 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 the Pahlavi family was was uh, was crooked, and at the same time, as Jim described. <clears throat> the Shah's regime that was a modernizing force in terms of both uh, education, uh, education, technology, uh, 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 economics, and <clears throat> the Khomeini regime, the Khomeiniists, just the opposite. All they are after is uh, now self-aggrandization, and they're crooked. I've, I've had... Uh, Several Iranians, uh, expatriates here in the U.S., who still have family contacts in uh, in Iran, tell me yeah, it was bad under the Pahlavis. Well, it's even worse now, and I won't go into all the details of one particular uh, situation involving uh, some apartment houses in, in Tehran, but what it used to take to pay the the regime to uh, get all the or the locals in the uh, Tehran uh, to get something done. There was a, a, a almost built-in bribe on it. Well, now it's about five times larger than it was, and that, that's even accounting for inflation. Now, can I check the story out? I did a little bit, and it was darn close to what was published about what the uh, what what the corruption costs for. Uh, construction and uh, modernization uh, of housing in Tehran. The, 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 the religious dictatorships even more crooked than the, the Shah's dictatorship. Uh, Shah's dictatorship has aspects of what we might are call an uh, authoritarian instead of a, uh, a, a an outright tyranny. Uh, because uh, uh, the Shah, you could read almost anything you wanted, and if you had a satellite dish, you could watch whatever. That's not what happens with the uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, they go around like the, the, the communists did in, in Russia, Eastern Europe, and try to make sure your satellite dish or whatever connection you had because it's uh, turned east. You can't turn it west. Uh, that, that's succeeded. It, it didn't stop everybody from being uh, able to pick up uh, West German and and uh, French and Finnish satellite uh, uh, t t uh, television, uh, but it, uh, it it may largely succeed. Well, the porosity of the internet means that we actually uh, the Iranians have a better idea, much better idea, th th about what <clears throat> is going on elsewhere in the world and about how depraved their own regime is. But you still get tossed in jail if uh, you get you get caught with. Uh, uh, listening to alternative points uh, points of view. And the Iranians don't like that. They don't like the fact they can't get clean water. At one time, and we covered this on, on, on strategy page, I think there were five major cities that had uh, extensive water problems, and it was because of corruption and not fixing the local water infrastructure. Major cities. Wasn't affecting Tehran, interestingly enough, but it was other uh, other cities in, inside Iran. Uh, 
that the regime is despised. And the target, the hit list, I would like to hit, is not just the nuclear nukes, but the key targets of the Revolutionary Guard Corps. I'd like to do that. I'd also like to take out uh, Iranian uh, assets right around the uh, Strait of Hormuz, Bandar al Abbas, there where they base out a lot of their uh, speedboats, even some of their autonomous uh, watercraft now, so that they could threaten tankers and threaten shipping, uh, both at the, uh, in the Persian Gulf and uh, in the Ara- Arabian Sea. Uh, I'd I'd like to see that shot up, and uh, th- that'd be extremely useful to have that done, and it would actually protect international commerce. Would it hurt the regime? Yes, it would. There are also a couple of places that I, I, I don't have the in t- current intelligence on it, but where they ship weapons uh, to uh, uh, Yemen and also to, uh, to, to Syria. That, that's on a, a, a couple of ports that are uh, on the uh, Arabian Sea. Okay, uh, let's take those out. And we have the power to do it. And it, it would help the Iranian people. That's the thing. Well, that sounds reasonable, Austin. Um, it sounded radical, Dan, but that's what you're faced with, and it's we can do that. We can do. Yeah. So, Jim, the most dangerous proxy that Iran has, perhaps, is Hezbollah. Are they going to be able to keep them under control if they've lost control of some of these other groups? Well, they want to hang on to Hezbollah. They've invested heavily uh, into Hezbollah for decades. And the Israelis are now attacking uh, North, and and they are basically (laughs) making a calculation. Is it worth the losses to go in and take apart Hezbollah? Uh, The the Israelis, you know, are basically uncertain if it's going to be worth it uh, because the uh, Iranians could basically build up you know, something similar. It might take them longer. Uh, they would lose a lot of influence for a while uh, because Hezbollah has played a major role in destroying the Lebanese government. I mean, Lebanon no longer has a government uh, between, you know, Sunni radicals uh, in the north and uh, the uh, Hezbollah in the south and uh, various, you know, factions in between. Uh, the country has ceased to be a, a normal country. I mean, it's a fragment of a country. It barely you know, functions, uh, you know, the ports that used to be major sources of income for the for the country no longer uh, serve that purpose because they're un- unreliable, full of hostile, you know, warring parties. Uh, Lebanon has a lot to uh, gain by Hezbollah being destroyed, but Hezbollah will go easily, and the Israelis have to basically calculate, can we really justify the losses? I mean, they've already, they have already suffered heavy losses, first from Hamas, you know, out of Gaza, and now they're fighting in the West Bank. Uh, you know, they want to get rid of the, uh, the Palestinian, uh, the Hamas radicals. Uh, the Hamas is not popular with most uh, Palestinians because they're they're basically a bunch of religious fanatics who will kill, you know, p- fellow Palestinians if they feel these Palestinians are uh, are opposing what Hamas wants to do, uh, which is basically destroy Israel. Yeah, they, they their motto is from the river to the sea. That's from the, they want to be in control of, of uh, the area from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean coast. And that means no more Israel. The Israelis are not going to allow that. Remember, the Israelis are the only uh, uh, country in the Middle East that has nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles to deliver them with. Uh, but that apparently doesn't bother the uh, religious fanatics in Iran because they hate we're on a mission from God. Uh, if they nuke us, you know, it's God's will. You know, we'll get through it, et cetera, et cetera, sir. It's really a bizarre situation. But this religious fanaticism is nothing new in the Middle East. And uh, you have to be careful, you know, how how you push them because they will basically take a major hit and then, you know, get another lease on life. Somebody always survives. And basically say, we have to defeat these, you know, these heathens, these Westerners. See, they're trying to destroy us. Uh, right now, most people in Iran want the uh, fanatics to be destroyed, but that's difficult to do. You know, an internal rebellion is a very ugly situation. They've had, they had them before. That's how they got rid of the Shah. 
but the Shah's replacement, you know, the IRGC and the and the religious government is far more dangerous and fanatical and willing to kill Iranians than the Shah ever was. So, Austin, what happens if uh, Iran loses control of Hezbollah? What happens if they lose control of it? Then yeah. I, I, I think Jim's analysis is 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 as good as it good as it gets. Uh, here's here is something a supposition that, that we have here is that they have the complete control over Hezbollah right now. They may not. They may think they do. Uh, they may have control as long as they're supplying money, supplying weapons, and and, and uh, selecting Hez, Hezbollah leaders. But there could be some. Uh, and I'm, I would say, in in knowing human beings, there there the kind of individual I'm about to describe certainly exists in Hezbollah, who's really a local warlord waiting to become a local warlord. He's a uh, breakdown, fragmentation, and further chaos, <laughs> yeah. and an internal war in, in Hezbollah over who's the uh, g- going to control the organization, and suddenly it's five or six smaller organizations, what we've seen happen with Mexican uh, drug cartel, uh, especially after uh, the Gulf cartel uh, fell apart. Then you had four or five uh, fragments, uh, some of them even more, led by even more vicious men than, than the group uh, are running the original Gulf cartel. Same thing with Hezbollah. Well, money money dries up, we got to find another gig. Uh I don't think I think some of these guys that all they know is 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 violence and and getting money from Iran. Maybe maybe they'll maybe they'll find another sponsor. I'm not sure who it would be. Could be the Chinese. I doubt that the Chinese want to get involved uh, in uh, Lebanon's mess. So that could happen. Fragmentation uh, fragmentation of Hezbollah and uh, it doesn't stop the chaos in Lebanon. It uh, might increase it. Well, the Iran, Hezbollah, the Houthis, they're they're all going to remain fodder for us for uh, a long time to come for episodes of Strategy Talk. So we'll wrap it up there, and we'll talk to uh, both of you next time. See you in two weeks. Hi, guys.